Hello everyone, it is September 29th, 2020, and we are starting a new series on Corinthians. Um, probably already started with uh, Pastor Bobby, but uh, we're going into, we finished Genesis, we finished the story of Joseph, and now we're starting a, a, a series on 2 Corinthians. And... 2 Corinthians is a continuation or like a second letter to the Corinthians after the first, you know, like duh. But what we don't know is that this is the second letter that is of significance. But there's two other letters that were lost over time that had minor information in regards to the situation that was going on in the church of Corinth. But uh, we have two major letters that Paul wrote to address certain issues and one of the biggest issues is that there were false teachers and false prophets or false apostles that were kind of leading the corinthian christians like astray and one thing that they were trying to do is discredit apostle paul saying that he wasn't legit like he's like compared to them he has no like credentials or authority and that they're just pretty much trying to diminish his leadership and all that he has done at this church um but we're going to go into Paul's kind of response to that uh, in chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. And so let me pray for us, and then we will get started. Lord, we just thank you for this time. And as we gather, we pray that we will be able to continue to discern your word. Um, Lord, today we're talking about Christian frustrations. Remind us, Lord, that the Christian walk, though it is hard and it's difficult, and the road may be bumpy, and we will definitely get frustrated. But remind us, Lord, that there is the grace to overcome everything. Over every bump, every frustration, every hardship, and every turmoil. So, Lord, help us to lean into the grace, not lean away from it. And more importantly, let us not lean into our own strength, God. We thank you and just I pray. Amen. And just as I prayed, uh, today we're talking about something called the Christian frustration. Like, Every Christian has gone through frustrations throughout their life and walk. But we're going to look at what causes one particular Christian frustration and what is the answer? What is the remedy, right? And so let's just read it real quick. So we're just going to say, as today we do a read-along, we're just going to go through verse by verse and sec section by section and then kind of just stop and give like a little commentary on each part. And then we're going to have like at the end, what do we do? What do we do about this, right? And so... Um, verse 1, it says, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You know that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Now, in chapter 3, there's going to be these moments where Paul makes a comparison between the old ways of doing things and the new way of doing things. And he, he used the word Old Covenant versus New Covenant. Old Covenant is the, the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments, the ritual of sacri animal sacrifice. And he's going to compare that to the New Covenant brought by Jesus Christ, the Gospel Covenant. And pretty much Paul is pretty much saying the Gospel Covenant, the new one, is far better, superior, and I mean, there's no other words to describe, right? It's, it's superior, better, and applicable to our lives. Now, in the sense that when I say applicable, not saying the old covenant wasn't applicable, I say maybe a better word is that it is more feasible or doable in the sense that the old covenant relied on human ability to fulfill. The new covenant relies on God's ability to fulfill. And if you know the, why that's so important is, if it's on our hands, it's going to fail. But if it's in God's hands, it's going to succeed, right? And so as Paul's writing this response, because there's these leaders who are teaching and leading the Christians astray, and a lot of the big struggles of the early church, not just at Corinth, but just early church in general, was that you needed Jesus and something else to fulfill the gospel. But the gospel is pretty much saying, no, you just need Jesus Christ. Believe and live for, to believe that he is Lord and Savior and that his death and resurrection was enough for you and me to be in heaven. 
But there is these false teachers who are trying to say, no, you need Jesus and this. And that's the gospel. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not you need to then do this, this, and this to make it a real reality. Because that's the trick, right? Is to make people start relying on what they can do, what they can't do as a, as a measure of their salvation or their savedness. And P Paul is saying to, to the Corinthians, hey guys, I don't need to defend myself here. Just like Jesus, he says, I don't have to defend myself. My works defend myself, meaning the fruit of my labors in God the Father validate who I am. And likewise, Paul's saying, they are questioning my authority. They're questioning my position as an apostle. But let me say this. My evidence of me being an apostle is not what I can say on pieces of paper, but my evidence is actually you. It says, you are the evidence of the godly work that I have done in you. He's saying, look at your faith. Look at who you are. You are not all Christians following God, loving God, and being loved by God. And not saying that Paul's saying it's because of me, because we'll see later on verse 4 through seven, 6, that he says, it's not by what I can do, but what God has done through me. But let's not get this twisted. I don't have to defend myself because you are in of itself. Like you are the you are the product. You are the evidence that it's not. I don't have to defend myself because clearly God is working through me by the way your life has shifted and changed. And so, he says, "You are the letter. You are the testimony." And that's the thing, right? The testimony of God's work is found in the stories of people's lives. That's why it's so, it's so important to testify, but also to hear testimony, to keep hearing about the works of God in people's lives. Because the work of God is, yes, found in written books, like people writing Christian books and whatnot to help people with Christian faith. But one of the greatest testimonies of the work of God is the stories of people's lives. My life, your life, the life of your family members, the life of your friends and our Christian family, right? And in verse 4, unlike these religious teachers, of all people, Paul could have been the one that says, hey, look at my credentials, look at what I've accomplished. But Paul, in his humility, which is one of the biggest signs of a Christ spirit-filled person, is humility, is he looks at verse 4 says, such confidence we have through Christ before God. He says, who? Through Christ. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Confidence and competence comes from the Lord. And that's what is a sign of a person living in the new gospel center covenant, the christ center covenant. That... Me as a minister, me as a leader, is not. I don't find my confidence in my ability or capability, but my confidence and competence comes from Christ. And that's going to be one of the big differences. When we walk this Christian walk, this is known as the gospel of grace. But it is absolutely strange, if not wrong, to think that what we receive in grace, we then now have to rely on our strength to fulfill. And same way for Paul, he says, what this ministry of the gospel of grace is started by grace. It is foolish to think that the leaders of this ministry is done, rely on their own strength and capability. What starts in grace is going to continue in grace and is going to end in grace. And we're going to see what does that look like in the Christian life, right? What does that mean is to live in grace rather than in works. And we're going to go through some signs, but... Paul is saying we are ministers of a new covenant, and this new covenant, the gospel covenant, is led and filled with the Spirit of God. And we're going to, in verse 7 to 18, we read, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glamorous? That's end of verse 8. Now, from 8 to 18, 
Paul starts describing the difference between old and new. And what is Paul talking about in terms of this idea of the Israelites looking at the face of Moses? Now, Moses is one of the most revered figures in Israelite history, Jewish history. He is still to this day. He's like pretty much one of the unofficial first king of Israel, though he wasn't given that title. He, he kind of acted in that fashion. I mean, he was played a pivotal role in the Exodus. Moses, when he went up into the mountain of God, to, I mean, to a mountain to converse with the Lord, they say that in the scriptures, when he came back down, that because he was face to face with God, not like face to face literally, but that he was encountering the manifest presence of God, that the glory of God shined upon Moses, and then Moses' face was glowing. Um, if I were to imagine it, imagine like when Moses is coming down the mountain that he's like glowing, like he's radioactive. It's like, he's like, <laughs> like he was, he was reflecting the glory again. That's, that's what we as Christians should do, right? That if we've been in the presence of God, that we will start reflecting the light of God wherever we go. And that's what Moses was doing. That as he was talking with God, as a man talks to another man face to face, the glory of God was imprinted onto him and it started shining around him like a mirror, like a reflection. But what would happen is that as he was reflecting the glory of God, they needed to put a veil over him because over time, that light would diminish. And so to not make the Israelites believe that the glory of God is temporary or that God is limited, they will put a veil where they will get a tease and hint of the glory of God, but they won't able to discern the idea of it like diminishing. That's what happened. And he's saying, this ministry was glorious, but how much more the ministry of the Spirit of God? Because the ministry of Moses was temporary, but the ministry of the Spirit is eternal. And you're going to see this comparison of this is the old, this is the new, and the new is better. The old served a purpose, but the new serves an eternal purpose. Meaning it's not going to go away. It's not going to be replaced. And so he's saying in verse 9, if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is a ministry that brings righteousness? What does he mean by condemnation? The Old Testament, one of the biggest, I don't want to say flaws, because it's not saying that God is flawed in his thinking or his strategy, but the law of God, the Ten Commandments, was a way to start a conversation with God. Meaning, when God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments, he says, if you follow this, you are able to walk with me. But you got to follow it perfectly. But what's the issue? Nobody can follow it perfectly. That's why you got to keep sacrificing animals to get rid of the sin. And so what the law should have done was to cause a, a, a conviction in the heart to say, God, we can't do this. We keep failing and failing and failing. And you and I might have that same feeling, right? God, I keep failing. I keep sinning. I keep falling. I keep doing the same thing. And we get frustrated because we can't do it. And that is the purpose and the starting of the gospel and the good news is that, yes, you can't do it, but you, were meant, you weren't meant to be the one to do it. God is. In the sense that not that you're not accountable, but Christ is going to be accountable on your behalf but fill you with the Spirit of God so that you may walk with God. And so the old way was, here, here's a way to have a conversation with God, but you got to be perfect, which should have led them to say, God, we need a Savior. We can't do this. But what it did was, what, how they responded was, we got to try harder. How many of us have ever been in that boat, right? I just got to try harder. I just got to keep doing it. I'm not saying you don't give up. 
but a response to a failure regard in regards to sin is not try harder, but lean into God more. Meaning, God, I need you. And a and a great quote. I don't know where this is from. It's probably like a famous writer or something. Our response that reveals that we live in the new covenant and the gospel, kind of as opposed to the old, is when when we are in trouble. We don't try to hide from God, but we go to God to tell Him, "I need help." See, when we live in the old way, we rely on our ability to clean up. But in the new way, we rely on the truth that He already has cleaned us up by His sacrifice, and from that place of peace, get up and walk with God, not try to keep the rules of God. Because when you just try to keep the rules of God, this is the thing: when you're focused on keeping rules, you may not necessarily have a relationship with God. But when you have a relationship with God, the rules will be taken care of. Because not only because He has already taken care of it, but because you want to guard a relationship, you'll be more focused on preserving a relationship with God that inadvertently will fulfill the rules anyway. Now, do you mess up? Yes, but then there's the grace of God to say, you know what? I'm not gonna mope or cry about it, but I'm gonna get up and try again because my Savior said I can and I can and I'm going to. And so, for verse ten, for what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing greater glory. And if that what was transitory or temporary came with glory, how much greater is the glory that which will last? Meaning, the benefits of the new last. For ever, verse twelve. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. When we turn to the Lord, see a veil is like a see a veil is like you know a thin piece piece of cloth or a barrier that you get. A partial view of whatever it's covering. A veil partially reveals glory. Think about it.、Uh, not so much these days, but back in the day, at a wedding, the the bride would wear a veil to cover her face. Like you can, t- you could kind of make out her face, but you won't be able to see clearly her face. But what happens when someone removes the veil? They get to. Finally, see the glory and beauty of their bride. You get the fullness. You know how I said that the old covenant is like a starting conversation. You like you get to start start a conversation with God. The new covenant moves beyond just starting a conversation, but builds a relationship. And this idea of veil is that the old covenant gives you a glimpse. It teases you the glory of God. But the new covenant gives you the full blast of the glory because Christ reveals or gets rid of the veil, and you see the goodness and fullness of God fully. And verse eighteen, because of that, says all who with unveiled faces. So this is the outcome, the an actual outcome of those who have been unveiled is that we contemplate or focus on the Lord's glory because we're able to focus on the Lord's glory. We're no longer focusing on the brokenness of our sin, but we're focusing on the gloriousness of our perfect Savior. And so, what do we do with this? We are to live in the grace of God in the new covenant. So, here's what to do. What, if you want to get some to dos, here's some things you can do. Some things that you can help live out the gospel covenant. Focus on your relationship with God. Now these are going to be very simple, very broad, but how you carry it out is going to be up to you, right? 
or the things that you've learned in, in, in church. Focus on your relationship. This is the most important and very key thing you can do is focusing on whether that's through prayer, reading the Bible, joining in holy fellowship with your fellow brothers and sisters, listening to sermons, whatever the case may be, reading Christian books, reading books in general. Focusing on the relationship with God is the more the most primary and most important pursuit of any Christian in their walk. It is not becoming, it's not about becoming spiritually powerful or influential. It's about being connected to God. Which then goes on to focus on just doing the work of work for God. Which when you start focusing on doing the work of God, means serving the Lord, serving the body of Christ, serving the church, serving the community in the, in the name of God. We have to continue to do that while being led and heard by the Spirit, and hearing from God. So that's why the first thing is relationship. It's so hard to do ministry if you have no relationship with the Spirit. You'll burn out. You'll literally just burn out. And you'll become bitter, jaded, and maybe walk away. Now, what not to do? This may sound contradictory to some things on the first list, but let me explain. What not to do? One is this, work more. What do I mean by that? Because the in the first list says do work, but to not the not do list not work. Why is, it seems like a contradiction? What do I mean by not work? Not work more. When you and I are in hard times, and we are serving and we are burning out, the goal is not to serve more. The goal is to lean into God more in the secret place, in worship and intimacy. More oftentimes, we may burn out. There's multiple reasons. One reason is maybe we're doing a little bit too much, meaning we carry on too many responsibilities that we shouldn't be, and therefore we're overloaded. So therefore, we are overloaded. That's why we burn out. And that can have a whole list of reasons as to why we're overloaded. Maybe we think we're the savior. Maybe we think we have this guilt and therefore we want to keep working. What are the it's different for each person. The other way we would burn out is when, even though that the load is manageable, we still keep trying to do it without God's spirit. That's why we need to focus on God's in relation with God. We are not living in the new covenant if all we do is work more but not lean into our relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Working more does not build a real intimate relationship. You have to be intentional with it. You have to slot out time for it on a daily basis, not just up once in a while, but daily. Not during just retreats or mission trips or revival services, but daily. What you steward in the daily is far more important than what you do in just a season. Do not work more as the solution, but lean in more to the Lord. What not to do? Just like Paul, you are living in the old religious system when you focus more on defending your position and not letting God defend your position. Paul, he's like, you know what? I'm a minister of grace, and so therefore I'm going to walk by grace, live by grace, and I don't have to defend my position because that was given to me by grace. So therefore, rather than focusing on proving myself to you, I'm just going to live by the word of God. Now, Paul wasn't worried about man's opinion, but he was never. that doesn't mean he wasn't accountable to man's opinion because that's the response, right? It's like, oh, I'm, I don't want to entertain the fear of man, and therefore I don't listen to any man. That's not the point. The point is that you're not ruled by the voice of men, but the voice of God. But you also have to listen. You have to listen. Because if you don't listen, then you become prideful. And if you become prideful, then you become less connected to the Lord. When pride enters the picture, God leaves the picture. And that's when you start operating more in an old covenant way than a new covenant way. And so, just to recap, let's just focus on what to do. Primary, your intentional stewardship, protection, growing of your relationship with God. Serving the Lord, 
And as you serve, continue to hear from the Lord. And it's like a cycle. Build your relationship with God. All right? We should start a new series. Hopefully that whenever there's a Christian frustration, that maybe that's a sign to go seek the Lord, that you've been depriving your soul of seeking the Lord intentionally and being filled by his presence. Because most Christian frustration, not all, but most, comes not from an overabundance of God in one's life, it's actually the lack of. And people say, oh, but I always go to church. Hey, just because you go to church doesn't mean you have a good relationship with God. You can be just as lost in, inside the house as much as you can be lost outside the house. And so always check your heart. Be blessed.